Is it okay? Uh, okay, it's live. Okay, madam. Huh? Uh, I will call you after five minutes. Then. You make me host. Okay. Sir, we can start. Okay. Sir, we start? Yeah. Yes, sir, you can start. Okay. Uh, well, very good, good afternoon. Uh, ABM Dr. Ajit Tyagi, President of SAMA, Professor Zon Thiru Vadigal, Dean of Science, SRMIST. Professor Dr. Tohida Rasid, Provost and Chairman, Department of Meteorology, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. Professor Yushi Mahanti, IIT Bhubaneswar, members of the advisory panel of the lecture series, members of the organizing committee, our institutional members from the Center for Science and Technology of the Non-Aligned Movement Countries, NAM SMT, RIMES, and EC Mode, distinguished participants from from 41 countries, I suppose, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you on behalf of the South Asian Meteorological Association, SAMA, and SRMIS Institute of Science and Technology. This is the first uh, attempt on capacity building of people in the field of atmospheric weather and climate sciences by SAMA and SRMIST. We have a distinguished panel of very senior professors and scientists from reputed institutions of this region who are experts in the fields. They will deliver lectures on the fundamentals of the subject. This lecture series is targeted to the postgraduate students and professionals of non-meteorological background who are interested in learning the subject of weather and climate sciences for research and operations. This lecture series on selected topics of atmospheric physics will continue for four months and afterwards, we shall start the next series of lectures on atmospheric dynamics, uh, numerical weather prediction, satellite meteorology, radar meteorology, and other related subjects. As informed earlier, certificates will be given to the participants who are registered for the course and uh, will complete the entire course with at least 75% attendance and successful performance in an evaluation test at the end of the course. The lectures are live streamed on the YouTube channel of Sama. They will also be available afterwards on the YouTube for those who could not attend the lectures on live. We shall try to have more interactions between the speakers and the participants in this lecture series. Please write your questions in the chat box. Our moderators will pick up the questions at the end of the lecture and they will be answered by the speaker. So enjoy the lectures and we wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for welcoming the participants, advisory panel member, and organizing panel members, and uh, dignitaries from SRMIST. So now I request uh, Tyagi, sir, Professor AVM Ajit Tyagi, President, uh, South Asian Meteorological Association, uh, to address the gathering. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Lakshmi, and I join uh, Professor Someshwadas in welcoming our advisory panel members, organizing committee, um, colleagues from the SRM IST and all participants. It's really a matter of great honor, happiness that we are able to launch this very ambitious program. And I am at the outset, I'd like to thank advisory panel members for their guidance in, in conceptualizing this program and also for their support and willingness to deliver the lectures in. Uh, or a period of four months. Now, as uh, we all know that over a period of time, uh, weather and climate sciences have out overgrown or outgrown the basic atmospheric sciences or meteorology. Now it encompass, en encompasses various branches to become a truly multidisciplinary where encompassing oceanography, uh, hydrometeorology, uh, aviation meteorology, agrometeorology, and Advancements in science and technologies are being very much assimilated in the systems, be that it's simulation, high power computing, and using the state of art object systems, satellite radars, microwave radiometers, radars. So, and uh, we are now attracting uh, students and researchers from 
not only from uh, the science branches of the physics core physics which used to be earlier but from all branches of science and engineering and allied subjects even the social scientists are being attracted now to the uh, weather and science because of its impact on the society and especially the climate change so keeping this in mind since the we have um, uh, researchers and students from the different backgrounds uh, we thought of uh, starting this program with the orientation uh, lectures uh, for important lectures being eminent um, uh, i think uh, personalities in this field uh, starting today's lecture on weather and climate science by professor monty followed by the weather and climate science services by dr mahapatra who is the director general of india meteorological department followed by research opportunities and the career opportunities in the weather and climate sciences by professor uh, sk dash who was with the iit uh, delhi and is also a member of executive council of international federation of meteorological societies and finally the latest observing systems uh, by ratnam uh, from the nrl uh, will be covering all state of art technology so it gives a see big picture of these and how the people from different streams can contribute and benefit from the sciences these will be followed by three uh, set of uh, classes online lectures on atmospheric thermodynamics atmospheric radiation and cloud physics by uh, professor dv rao from andhra university x uh, then atmospheric radiation by mukhopadhyay uh, from x imd and, and also uh, on climate sciences by deep kumar so we have a complete set of these programs and Uh, as uh, brought out by Professor Somesh Das, uh, will encourage interaction between the speakers and through the question answer session. And also, those who could not attend uh, these uh, lectures will be available on online on the YouTube. Thank you so much, and I look forward. And once again, I like to thank our partners, SRM IST. I, we are happy to have a dean here, to, uh, Professor John. and also uh, as brought out by professor dash the name which has played a very key role in you see we are not confined to south asia alone but 41 countries primarily covering the african where the name uh, snt has played a very key. also the international federation of met societies also have helped us to reach so many you see uh, developing and least developed countries so it's a matter of great satisfaction for sama and srm isd that we we are able to bring into our fold so many students and researchers from these countries so once again i wish and congratulate uh, the organizing committee uh, for planning this and executing this program and wish them all the best thank you uh, thank you uh, professor jagi sir for your nice words so now i request uh, professor jan tirudigal uh, dean sciences uh, srm institute of science and technology to say a few words thank you over to you sir Uh, thank you, Dr. Lakshmi Kumar, uh, distinguished uh, dignitaries, and dear participants. Very happy and prosperous New Year, twenty twenty three. I am very privileged in joining this inauguration event of Open Classroom Online Lecture Series in Atmospheric and Climate Sciences, an initiative conceived and being implemented by. South Asian Meteorological Association (SAMA) and SRM Institute of Science and Technology (SRMST), India. On behalf of SRM IST, I am honored to submit my heartfelt thanks and gratitudes to Professor Ajit Tiagi, President of SAMA, Professor Someshwar Das, Secretary SAMA, and the organizing team for this timely initiative. i strongly believe this seedling will certainly blossom into evergreen pasture that especially for south asian students and scientists will have their footprints in our carbon printed planet on behalf of srm institute of science and technology i wish this lecture series a grand success thank you thank you uh, very much sir uh, for your uh, nice words so now i request uh, uh, dr tohida ratish uh, rashid provost of dhaka university to say a few words 
addressing the gathering. Thank you. Over to you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, thank you. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, firstly, I would like to congratulate you, uh, the member of SAMA, uh, especially Professor uh, Shamashya Dash, Professor uh, Ajit Tiagi, sir, um, and all members of SAMA, and uh, SRM Institute of Science and Technology for jointly organizing, organizing this very I mean, time demanding program uh, for the young generation who are willing to understand whether climate, whether climate and climate change is issues. Because uh, we know that nowadays due to climate change, uh, life has become more challenging. And I think this is high time to uh, teach people about climate science and weather uh, as a fundamental topic to save their life and livelihood and cope up with the challenging situation. So uh, I'm uh, very happy to know that uh, about 1,200 students from 41 countries have registered for this program. And it shows that uh, this is, uh, 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 there is a huge demand of such program. So again, I thank uh, Sama uh, for creating this wonderful platform for the students who are not students of atmospheric meteorology uh, and who are very much willing to learn about these issues. So wishing a very successful program and I'm confident that this will be a very fruitful one as it's being organized by some uh, dynamic people and intellectuals like Professor Das, Professor Tiagi, and you see uh, Mohanty Sar is there and uh, I must Thank to Dean of uh, Science, RM, uh, SRM Institute of Science and Technology. Um, so uh, I think this will be a wonderful program. And uh, thank you for inviting me and giving opportunity to say something. And Department of Meteorology is the first in uh, department uh, who we established in uh, 2016. And this is the first uh, department uh, in Bangladesh, uh, which is offering bachelor uh, of uh, metro, uh, bachelor degree in meteorology. Uh, so um, I think Bangladesh, from Bangladesh side, Madam, please unmute me. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Here, uh, actually, uh, I'm outside and uh, it's a net, internet is very poor. So uh, that's all from my side. And uh, from Bangladesh side, I will always be with you and our students will always, and faculties will be, uh, uh, will be in contact with you and uh, wishing a very successful program. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Tawhida Rashid. So now uh, it's time for lecture. So before uh, commencement of the lecture, I request Dr. Rohini to introduce today's uh, speaker. This is going to be a first lecture uh, among the 16 lectures. So now I request Rohini uh, to introduce the speaker. Over to Rohini. Somebody is raising a hand. Do we have to allow them to raise the hand now? Oh, we can, we oh. can see at the end of the talk, sir. Right. We'll oh. take the questions, yes. If they have a question, they can write it. Yeah. 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 No, they are writing the questions. I see that nine questions are there already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let the lecture so, go. Yes. Yeah. So, Thank you, Dr. Lakshmi Kumar. So, good afternoon, everyone. And it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor UC Mohanty. He has done his PhD in tropical metrology in 1978 from Odisha Hydrometrological Institute, USSR. He has about 48 years of teaching and research experience in atmospheric sciences and climate sciences, working in IIT Delhi and IIT Bhutaneshwar. About 50 international visits to leading institutes like ECMWF, NCAR, NCEP, FF, uh, SF, FSU, NCSU, NRL, Purdue, and many more for the collaborative research work as well as scientific interaction. 
He has received many academic awards and honors, some of which I would like to list here. One is the Shanti Swarup Bhitnagar Prize. Another one, National Award in Atmospheric Science and Technology. He is also a fellow of many uh, academies. So Indian National Science Academy, Indian Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Sciences India, Indian National Academy of Engineering. He also received the Biju Patnaik Award for Scientific Excellence. Odisha Citizen Award, Award Sir, Sir Gilbert Walker Gold Medal, and many more. He has more than 237 national and international publications, and he has guided more than 38 PhD uh, students. He, some of them, like more than seven, are registered with him presently. His research interests are tropical metrology, numerical weather prediction, monsoon dynamics, regional climate studies, and mesoscale modeling. Today, he will be talking about overview of weather and climate. Welcome, sir. Uh, over to you, Dr. Lakshmi. Yeah, Dr. Rohini, you stop sharing. Mohan, sir, can you share your screen? Yeah. Yeah. So keep in presentation mode, sir. View mode. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Perfect, sir. Okay. Happy New Year to everyone. A uh, very good uh, day to everyone because it may be afternoon here and somewhere morning and evening. So at the outset, I thank uh, Professor Ajit Tagi and Professor Somisha Das and uh, Sama for inviting me to give the opening lecture on weather and climate sciences. So, uh, and I am also very thankful to the advisory committee and the organizing committee to organize it and uh, mobilize so many uh, participants from all over the world. That is uh, really very exciting and uh, congratulations to all of you. So my talk will be on fundamentals of weather and climate sciences, uh, in which I will try to cover the evolution of Earth's atmosphere, weather and climate systems, extreme weather events, climate change and enhance extreme weather events. So I will go as basic as possible to cover, cater all uh, type of participants we may have, starting from physics to that of the biology and environmental science and so on. So if we, if we see the evolution of our planet along with that our atmosphere, the evolution of the atmosphere goes as old as 4.5 billion years before BP. At that time, the atmosphere was full with hydrogen and helium. As you know, these outgassing gases like hydrogen and helium, they are very light gases and they are all escaped from the planet. In the course of time, we have a lot of volcanic eruptions and also burning of the comets. And with that, the atmosphere was filled with water and carbon dioxide. At that time, carbon dioxide was quite high concentration. But when water started cooling down and started forming the clouds and rain, most of the carbon dioxide was dissolved and come back. And due to this rain, and snow, that precipitation, then water started accumulating in the low-lying areas, forming the oceans. Only 2.8 billion years back, first life was uh, appeared in our planet, that is the uh, cyanobacterias. These cyanobacterias, uh, through the photosynthesis processes, try to release oxygen. Otherwise, we don't have oxygen, and as you know, there is no life without oxygen. So therefore, when water is there, oxygen is there, and carbon is there, then life started. And that gradually grows up, and then 
we came to the present atmosphere, which is so beautiful and so pleasant to stay. So if we assume that we have sun and earth, there is no atmosphere, then we can make a simple calculation for solar input and then output from the reflection from the short waves and then uh, radiation from the uh, earth surface without atmosphere, then our simple calculation will show that our temperature would have been 255 degree Kelvin. That mean temperature, which is minus 18 degree. That means if there is no atmosphere, it is only sun and earth, then we may not have any light in our planet. But with the atmosphere in between, if we make a calculation with atmosphere, then we will see that our surface temperature mean will be 288 degree Kelvin, that means plus 15 degree K. So that means from minus 18 to plus 15, that 33 degree is what is our atmosphere is protecting us like a blanket. Now it is winter many parts, and you know in the winter we use the blanket to protect our body. Blanket in all that give the one, but it protect us, not leaving all the radiation from our body and cooling down us. So same way, the atmosphere was, the, our Earth planet is so suitable for living light, it is because of the atmosphere which keeps it warmer and comfortable for the life in our planet. And that is what we call this as a greenhouse effect or greenhouse gases. So if we don't have atmosphere that is like that, but if we have blanket and we put another blanket, suppose you are very greedy to put two blankets or so, then you start sweating. And that is what we are now facing, the, and which I'll cover subsequently about the global warming in a brief, that is what thickening our atmosphere with more greenhouse gases. So if we see the composition of our atmosphere, then broadly, as you all know, it is nitrogen, which is 78%, Oxygen is 21 percent, and rest is the remaining gases uh, like nitrogen, uh, uh, oxygen. We have argon, carbon dioxide, water vapor, and so on. So, if we put in that in details, so you can see we have two type of gases in our atmosphere, which is one is the permanent gases, that is nitrogen, oxygen, argon, neon, helium, hydrogen, xenon which is our most actually 99.99. Remaining trace, are trace gases, which are variable gases. They are your water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, and pollutant particles like dots, soot, and so on, and chlorophyll carbons. So these are the major composition of our planet Earth. But this composition is such, it keeps our planet Earth we say very warm and comfortable temperature for the life in the planet. So, and in that atmosphere, obviously come across the major things, the weather and climate. This, this application of weather and climate is enormous. It has application in various sectors, starting from agriculture or food, food security we get from the agriculture that came from the water that comes from the hour. Weather systems that will come subsequently, water resources, surface and groundwaters, transportation, like aviation, shipping, surface transport, and so on, different services, industry and mining, clean energy, because solar energy, hydro energy, wind energy, that all also depend upon the weather and climate things. Health issues, like vector one diseases, water and air uh, epidemics, and so on, communication, Communication, they very much use the weather and climate system that what is the temperature and all things, what is the uh, 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 ion sphere and how it is varying and so on. Tourism and disaster mitigation and many, many aspects. But I have only pointed out few of them that application of weather and climate science in the different sectors in the society. In fact, this is science which is called science for common man. It is starting from the president of our head of the institution to that of the, the lowest stream of the person, uh, the people in the street, to people in the palace, everybody need ozone climate information in various aspects. 
So what is the difference between weather and climate? Because being it is a general thing, actually I'm giving very, very basic. So those who already know the science, so please excuse me uh, for going to that sm uh, small level of things. The weather is the state of the atmosphere or earth at a given time, it is few hours, few days, and at particular time, that is what we call weather. Like I tell you what is today weather or what is going to tomorrow or what is going to tomorrow afternoon, that is weather. Climate is the average atmospheric conditions over a longer period of time. And as per WMO classification, it is 30 years or more. So that means it's a mean thing. So that means if somebody asks, what is our temperature in one place? when you see the conference browser and so, so on, you get a climate information. It is winter or summer, you have to go with a umbrella or you have to go with a coat. So that is the average uh, value, that is the climate for long-term average, otherwise instant values or short-term is the weather. The weather and climate elements, if we see, then we are broadly have Weather elements that is, we cover as like wind, temperature, pressure, humidity, and density. Wind, when it comes to wind, it is a, as you know, it is a three components because wind is a vector. So it has zonal wind, east west direction, meridional wind, north south direction, and vertical wind. Three temperature, pressure, humidity, and density. So as such, they are the seven variables. The fundamental element of variables are seven variables. But we have large number of processes. Few of them, like precipitation, which is consist of rain or snow or rubbles and thunderstorms, cyclones, monsoons, clouds, fog, visibility, and so on. They are the processes uh, in the atmosphere. So if we see the principles of weather and climate, then major thing the energy sources. The energy, because in the atmosphere, as I told that the wind is there, of course the fields that I told, seven variables, there are two fundamental categories. One is the motion, another is the mass. So any, like any other fluid, the atmospheric fluids, which combination of a, number of gases, as I told you, uh, that also behave in the same manner, and it has two fundamental things. One is the mass, another is the motion. Wind represents the motion, and the rest of the parameters, they represent the mass. So if we see the principles of the weather and climate, they are of the following five. One is the energy source. Energy is the major thing to make the atmosphere with wind, because we call that the, the wind is ceaseless, it is always moving. That means it is, has a kinetic energy, where from it will come. So if you see the source, that is only the radiation. So the radiation, where from it coming? It is coming from the sun. So the sources of the energy for our atmosphere to be active, that is the solar energy, energy source. Second is that forces which makes the motion, because for simple Newton's law, you know that Newton's first law, second law, third law, where actually we know that key, the forces, they give the motion, or uh, rate of change of momentum that gives the motion. So the forces, that is dynamical and physical forces, atmospheric motion, that is the wind, mass of the atmosphere, of course, they are represent pressure is the mass of the atmosphere, but pressure depends on various factors, it depends upon the temperature, it depends upon the water vapor it contains, and it depends upon the density. So it is interdependent of all those things, they represent the mass of the atmosphere. In addition, our planet is a blessed planet compared to any other planets uh, in our solar system, and that is with water. Because there's no light without water, what is the major ingredient that is what we have in our Earth's atmosphere. And as we go on, you will see that all the weather and the climate systems, they are really due to water. If there's no water, perhaps we may not have such lovely clouds 
and these great cyclones, thunderstorms, monsoon, all these things what we are talking of that we know may not have if there is no water. And water has been nice hydrological cycle. So all these five aspects I will cover in a brief before I go further. So if we see the basic mechanism of the weather, weather results from temperature difference from one place to another. Why? On large scale, temperature differences occur because areas closer to the equator receives more energy from the sun per unit area from that of the uh, polar regions. On local scales, temperature difference can occur because of different surfaces, such as the ocean surface, forests, ice sheets, uh, or man-made objects like our urban growth and uh, building and different structures and so on, and vegetated land and barren land and so on have different physical characteristics and they have different actually uh, also uh, heat capacity of different substances different giving the same amount of heat suppose you have iron and you have a copper they will not be heated up the same way it depends on the heat capacity so therefore the temperature at the surface at the different places they depend upon also very much on the surface characteristics so and it also characterizes the reflectivity, roughness, or moisture content. Surface temperature difference in turn causes a pressure difference. Because where it is a high pressure, high temp higher temperature, then air will be warmer and expands, then it becomes lighter with less molecules, and then it is low pressures compared to the denser area or colder area, which is denser area, which is high pressure. So head hot a hot surface heats the air above it and the air expands, lowering the air pressure and the reverse it takes place in the polar area. This is resulting horizontal pressure gradients that assess the air from high to low pressure because like any other things from high to low, if you have two uh, levels of water and you connect it, then water from high level, it will go to low level. Same thing happened in the nature with all the fluids. So from high pressure, the pressure gradient gives it from high pressure, the air blow to low pressure. But our RC is not a stationary. Our frame of reference are not like Newton's. He thought that time in Newton's law because our arts are a rotation frame. It is not a stationary frame. So it is not an inertial coordinate. It is a rotating coordinate system. So as a result, when arts is, air is blowing, our arts is also rotating. And that we call as Coriolis force. This Coriolis effect that try to make the owing to move in a curved path. Like as example, suppose you are making a record player, a player is your body is rotating, and you want to make a straight line from one periphery to other, to center. You are making a straight line, but the time you stop it, you will see that it is a curved path because your system itself is rotating. Small scale examples are coastal bridges, and where actually land and sea bridge, you know that it occurs because of the temperature difference in the day and night over the land, over the ocean. So I will not go much about that, but as you know, daytime land is heated up much faster because of its lower heat capacity. And then it became low pressure with the land and ocean heats up slowly because it is high, higher heat capacity. It is about 4.5 times higher. So therefore, land is heated fast in the daytime, the air will blow from the ocean high pressure to low. But in the night time, land cool down because it is not a good reservoir of heat, but ocean is a good reservoir of heat and it remains warmer. So as a result, ocean became cooler, warmer and land became cooler in the night and the wind blows in the reverse direction. That is what we call the coastal bridge or land sea bridge. That is a simple example how the temperature makes the flow in the atmosphere. Because if you take the signs of Ocean climate, it is definitely the wind. The strong temperature constraint between the polar and the tropical air gives rise right to the jet streams. So you know that the Australian jet stream is very famous, and all of you know that it is around the globe. Besides that, we have local jet streams are there, like we have the Somali jet low level in the monsoon time, or we have tropical easterly jet, and many, many small jets are there, but a major jet is the mid-latitude jet that is the 
oyster that are on the whole globe in the northern hemisphere, and this is the weather system in the caused by the instability, uh, and this that causes the instability. Weather system in the tropics are caused by the different processes such as monsoon or organic thunderstorms and so on. The Earth's axis are digital related to its orbital plane. Sunlight is incident at different angles at different times of the year. In June and June, the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, closer to sun. So at any given northern hemisphere latitude, sunlight falls more directly on that spot than in December and the reverse in the southern hemisphere. And this effect causes the seasons that you all know very well. So now I'm coming the first mechanism that is the radiation, that is the energy. So Earth's energy balance, if you see Earth's energy balance, the source of energy, the sun, that is what we get at the top of the atmosphere, that is about 342 uh, watts per meter square. And if I take that is 100%, then when it penetrates to the, our atmosphere, a part of that is reflected by the clouds, aerosols, and atmospheric gases. Part is reflected at the albedo of the surface and the remaining part is observed. So if 342 watts at the top of the atmosphere, when it reach at the at ground, that here, our earth surface, it becomes 168. That means 51% of the energy comes from sun that comes to the direct to earth surface, remaining is reflected various processes. And you remember that in the atmosphere, almost a transparent to the solar energy, which is we call a short wave energy, because you know from the uh, OMC displacement law that key lambda maximum that depends upon the inversely that of the temperature. So therefore, solar radiation, which comes from the sun, its outer sphere of the sun temperature is about 6,000 degree Kelvin whereas our earth surface is around 300 degree Kelvin. So 6,000 versus 300, if you see the sun radiated energy, that's the solar energy comes in a waveform and what we call the short wave because one by 6,000. But the radiation that is the, goes from our earth surface because anybody which receives the energy, absorb it and it emits. And this emission depends upon the temperature of the body. So therefore, the solar energy, which comes as short wave energy, that is almost transparent in our atmosphere. Nothing is absorbed. Mainly, it is all reflected or come down. But one that 51%, that 168 watt per meter square reaches the earth surface, it is partitioned in three major ways. One is that radiation. The earth uh, absorbs this radiation because earth is not a black body, but it's a gray body. So it absorbs this radiation and then it has to emit. But when Earth emits, it will be one by 300 degree Kelvin. So one by 300 emits is a longer wave. That is we call it terrestrial radiation. And this longer radiation is absorbed by various things, mainly by the water bodies and many of the greenhouse gases that you are familiar with all of you because nowadays everybody knows what is greenhouse gas. You have the carbon dioxide, you have the methane, you have the so on, many gases. So they absorb, even water vapor is a good observer of this long radiation. So therefore, all the radiation arts emits, it is not escaped. It is trapped by our atmosphere, as I told at the beginning. And after trapped, then radiation have no direction, so it can emit in all directions. So some of the radiation, they come back to the earth surface. So net radiation that is escaped by longer radiation emission from earth surface is about 21%. Otherwise, it emits 390 degree, 390 watt per meter square. That means if there's no atmosphere, we get 168 watt per meter square and we, we emit 390 watt per meter square. So that means you can know that it, our atmosphere must have cooled down substantially, but it is not happening because of these gases in our atmosphere. And they are mainly, actually, as I show you different type of gases, they are mainly variable gases. And they absorb it and trap the radiation. So ultimately, only 21% escaped through the, this thermal radiation 
or long wave radiation that is emitted or it is known as a terrestrial radiation. The remaining part, major part goes back the evaporation, that is the latent heat, and it is evapotranspiration. We will come more detail about evapotranspiration later on, but you know that we have plenty of the water, but really the water we get as a fresh water on our planet, which we use for our own drinking and for many, many activities in agriculture, food security, everything, water resource, they are only less than 1%. But that comes in the process of the evapotranspiration of the water. Otherwise, the rest of the water, about 97% are in the ocean. I will tell you details afterwards. And they are the not usable, they are saline waters. So this fresh water, which comes through the latent heat, and that takes away about 23%, that is the majority of the things, that is 78 watts, it goes. And second thing is the thermal heat, that we, which we call the thermals, they are the sensual heat. Sensual heat contributes to our 70%, because our earth surface, because they heated up, then air have a heat, if you, uh, less temperature, then we get the sensual heat, that heat actually, if like you have a heater and you are sitting before that, you get some, type of heat that is your sensible heat. So that is 7%. Like that way, if you add this thing 21, 23 plus 7, it is again 51. That means annual scale of whatever we get energy from the sun reaching the earth surface, earth never keep it. It gives back in these three ways. That is the long wave radiation, which is going on all the time. And we have latent heat and sensual heat. And that's why year after year, year after year, we have a good balance of the energy. And this energy makes that neither our Earth become warm up nor cool down in a global scale. And that is what is occurring all the time. And But in between that, as you know, that we have, if we see the zonal distribution of this energy in the annual scale, then we have surplus energy in the equator and tropics because there we get direct solar radiation. So in the global radiation balance, reasonable climate at mid to high latitudes because of the wind and ocean currents, because when the surplus energy we have, heat energy in the tropical region, that is how we define the tropics from 30 degree north to 30 degree south, where we have generally surplus of the energy. And that is surplus between means net short wave that is coming and net long wave that is going. So this surplus energy actually transported to from surplus region tropics to the mid latitude and polar regions, both by the ocean and atmosphere as the currents or as wind. Then if we see the vertical structure of the, our atmosphere with the composition that I have told you, our atmosphere is so that we have the maximum heat, you can see that on the surface. Why? Because the energy that which is coming from the sun, it is not absorbed by our atmosphere. Our atmosphere is transparent. So all the energy that you want to reflect it only, and then reflection will never give the heating it is only when it is absorbed, and it is absorbed 51% at the surface. So surface gets really heated up, and then it starts radiating, and it starts giving the sensual and latent heat, which becomes warm up. Our planet is nicely divided in a vertical structures. We have also different layers. We have the troposphere, we have a stratosphere, we have a mesosphere, we have thermosphere. I don't have time very much to go all the details, and all our weather that occurs in the troposphere, the green uh, uh, bar that is at the bottom, that is your troposphere, and the height of the troposphere, it maximum at the equator, about 16 kilometers, at the pole, it is about eight kilometers, and the mean is about 12 kilometers. This is the layer where actually most of the air which give the weather and climate systems. Because above the troposphere, we have a tropopoles, where the temperature started rising. That means a strong inversion takes place at tropopause. Tropopause makes it separate our troposphere from the stratosphere. And most of the water and water vapor, which we tell that it is coming, and that comes from the evaporation, 
and we can condense cloud or ice, but it will remain in the troposphere. Only exceptional cases of very severe thunderstorms or very strong tropical cyclone, it may be a little bit penetrated to stratosphere. But in the stratosphere, due to ozone content in the stratosphere, stratosphere temperature rises. So that means it's an inversion layer. And if temperature rises, then it is difficult to penetrate because that what we call the inversion in the atmosphere. I don't have a time to cover all those things, but I tell you that if we have a dry atmosphere without water vapors and so on, our temperature falls at the rate of 9.8 degree centigrade per kilometer. That is what we call lapse rate in the atmosphere, 9.8 degree centigrade. But being we have a water vapor in the atmosphere, which actually takes the latent heat and when it's condensed, it releases it. So atmosphere gets warm up. So therefore, in a moist atmosphere, the lapse rate is 6.5 degree Kelvin, 5 degree centigrade per kilometers, and that is the lapse rate. So in that way, it is decreases, but in the stratosphere, it increases. So if it increases, it like a lead, it does not allow air to move in that. Because unless atmosphere unstable, it will not go. So therefore, the stratosphere, and then we have a stratospose, then after that, we have mesosphere, and then we have the thermosphere and ionosphere. So I will not spend much time on that. And as I told you, atmosphere is heated from the bottom. In the atmosphere, as I told you already, the major force that drives our atmosphere, that is the pressure. Where we have more molecules of air molecules, then it will be high pressure. Where we have less molecules, it's a low pressure. It is a schematic diagram. Here I am showing you left hand side, we have more and more molecules, then we have the high, high pressure, and such molecules remain if our atmosphere is relatively cooler if surface is cooler. But if it is warmer up, as I told you, it is warm up, then actually it will become, expands the air. So that means the molecules will spread more and then you become lowest pressure. And you remember that if atmosphere is cold and dry, it is more heavier than if the atmosphere is warm and moist. Because if you have two same parcel of air, one is the dry air, one is the moist air. Many of you will think that the moist air will be heavier. No, my friends, it is a dry air. Dry air will be heavier than moist air, and dry air will be there if the cold, and cold means it is dense. So cold and dry air is always heavier compared to the warm and moist air. So that distinguishes with a high pressure and a low pressure. Once high pressure and low pressure is established, as I told you, then we get a force that means from high to low. So the air molecules, they move from the high pressure to low pressure, and that is what we call pressure gradient force. That gives the pressure gradient force, that gives us the motion. Then comes the wind, because due to the pressure gradient force, we start getting the wind. I am showing a cartoon to you, because wind, we, none of us, we can see the wind. Have you anyone have seen the wind? No, you, none of you have seen the wind. You can see the air. Uh, you cannot see the air, but you can see the water. So wind, we cannot see. But the central goal of atmospheric science is to learn about the winds because most of our weather systems consist of the high pressure and low pressure, and this high pressure and low pressure, they move with the wind. So therefore, they to understand why they come to our life and why they take the forms and patterns they do and why they change and evolve and they finally die in the birth of the new winds, that is a major aspect of the atmospheric science. The cartoon is that, in a 14th century, one priest, he saw that he, he the trees that are actually bending because when we need their clapping, you know that the uh, tree will bend. So it was bending, so he thought that he, there's a ghost is there in the backward and which is bending that and he's not seeing it. 
So he took a stick and searching that uh, ghost who is making this, bending the tree. At that time, you are not knowing that wind is blowing and that's why it is happening. So the knowledge about the wind contributes to the theory of the atmospheric motion. So this theory is a human creation. I believe it mirrors nature's plan for the winds. With it, we can reach for and perhaps even touch some of the wind's own truth. That means only by mathematics and by the mathematical models or physical concepts, when we formulate a uh, laws of the motion, then we can see that it is different type of wind, and we, we may have geostrophic wind, we may have a cyclonic flow, and we may have anticyclonic motion and so on, and we have trough and ridge and so on, waves in the atmosphere, everything we get when we know the laws of the wind. The central goal of the atmospheric science is to learn about the winds and to understand why they come to light and why they take their forms and patterns, because in, as you know, in the case of a cyclone in the Northern Hemisphere, we have a anti-clockwise wind in a spiral form. And in the case of a high pressure, then we have a anti-cyclone, then we have a clockwise wind. And that is a universal truth. And I will not take time for that because we don't have enough time for that. But you know that that is how uh, and the reverse mirror image in the southern hemisphere. And similarly, atmospheric dynamics combines the thermodynamics of the heat and energy transfer and mechanism of motion to produce a theory of thermally forced motion on a rotating planet Earth. That is the winds. That is what I told you, that how the weather evolved. Knowledge about the wind contributes to the theory of the atmospheric motion. So this theory is a human creation. And we believe that this gives us the, what is the reality of the nature. And this is actually how we get the high pressure and low pressure. And high, high pressure and low pressure in the atmosphere. And in the high pressure, it is high to low. Then wind blows from the center to outer peri, periphery. And low pressure, it is low. Uh, and outer is high. So we have wind blows from the high to low. And then we have the, if not close, low pressure and high pressure, then we have the trough and ridge. This is cyclonic wind. You can see that we have a anti-clockwise anti -clockwise motion in the atmosphere. And this is satellite picture, which tells that how the wind actually there is the colors. You can see that the wind is blowing in anti-clockwise in a spiral form. Similarly, we have in the atmosphere due to blowing of the wind and we have some permanent pictures uh, there. We have the uh, low pressure is always in the equatorial region because of the equatorial region. But uh, there actually we get a trade winds from northern hemisphere, which is northeasterly winds. And from southern hemisphere, we get a southeasterly wind because we tell wind direction where from it is coming, not in the conventional way where it is going. So therefore, we get northeasterly wind in the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere is southeasterly wind. And when they converge, then we have the region, we call it ITC there, intercontinental convergence of ITC there. And where actually in the low pressure zone and the air once converts, I'll show you later on, then you can rise this. In the low pressure region, air converts and rise and gives rise to clouds and bad weather. And then actually we have other post, subtropical region, high pressure cells are there. Then it is a subtropical jet stream we have there, westerly jet. And in between, uh, the air when it rise, it go again. When it rise, it will go somewhere. It cannot go indefinitely rise. So it rises at the equator and subsidizes in high pressure, where actually makes a cell, which we call the hardly cell. Similarly, we have six, uh, that is 30 degree if we take subtropical to the polar region and polar easterly we have, and in between we have the westerly from the high pressure to that of the uh, 60 degree, uh, either the side where we call the parallel cell. We have a hardly cell, we have parallel cell and a polar, polar easterly that in the polar region. That is how the wind is, that is the semi-permanent or almost permanent features 
of the, our circulation of wind in our atmosphere. Water, water is actually unique thing for our planet Earth, as I told at the beginning, because you know that when we go on our satellite to any of our planets, then first we explore whether water is there or not. Because water is alive. So that means you can you go to moon, you go to Mars, you go to any planet. Uh, or, uh, then you have first we explore from satellites that whether water is there or not. Because if water is there, there may be possibility of life. Then we can search the life there or not. So we are fortunate in our planet, whatever we see so beautiful green earth, green earth from the space and so beautiful with cyclones, anticyclones and so on, it all contributed to this water. If we see the water reservoir in our uh, planet Earth, you know, oceans, as I told in the beginning, they contain about 97%. They are general saline water and that we cannot use. Ice mass, about 2%. Groundwater is 0.68%. Lakes, 0.01%. Atmosphere, it contains only 0.001%. Rivers, even less. Biosphere, even less. And total, if you see that, 99.99. So that means, the, as you see, that he, we get only a small fraction of the water in the atmosphere. And but that lead to all our weather and climate systems in our planet Earth. And that is performed with a hydrological cycle, which is like I have shown you earlier, the energy cycle. This is a hydrological cycle. Before going to hydrological cycle, I tell water. Water is a life. You all know that if you have not a water in a day, how much difficult. Water gives the agriculture and food security. Water gives the domestic use, water for the ecological system, water for the production, and everywhere we need water. In our body itself, we have about 70% of the water. So this is how our planet is beautiful with this water. And water has a good water cycle. It starts with a evaporation. Then as you go up, it is temperature decreases, it cools down and then forms the clouds. Then when clouds move from the ocean area to the land area, and it gives the precipitation in the form of the water, as the rainwater, or snow and ice, after the condensation, they move, they're transported. Then this precipitation part goes as the infiltration, part goes the evapotranspiration, and part goes to the groundwater, and the remaining part runs as a runoff in the river systems and they fill the lake and so on and ultimately it comes to the ocean. So this cycle, complete cycle, it is a, known as a hydro, hydrological cycle which are the water storage in ocean, evaporation, condensation, transpiration and evaporation, condensation and then water storage in atmosphere as a clouds in the clouds, then it gives the precipitation and comes back as snow and uh, water and runoff and goes back. So this cycle is about two weeks in general, but it has a variation in various uh, from week to three or four weeks. And this is how we get the fresh water and for all our activities. That is the response to avoid and climate. This water vapor actually, in the atmosphere, it will remain in all its three phases because any substance, it can remain, uh, it has three states, that is solid, liquid, and vapor. In our atmosphere temperature is such that all the three phases, they coexist. We have the atmosphere, we have the snow and ice in the solid. We have the water vapors, water we have in the clouds, and we have the water vapors. So water vapor, liquid water, and solid water, these all are there in our atmosphere, in all these three states. But there's a transition between one phase to other, to other phase. Uh, and by that way, we release or observe the heat, and it may be the latent heat of evaporation, or heat, where heat is taken away, or it's condensation, which gives, rise, gives back that heat. 
and similarly melting or freezing and so on, deposition or sublimation. So I will again not take time, but that is a good process in the atmosphere taking place and our atmospheric temperature is such that the tropospheric temperature is such that we get all this three coexistence. Similarly, the water vapor contains, uh, which we all know as a relative humidity, because you know that when you see any report, they call the, what the temperature and what is the relative humidity. Relative humidity is the vapor pressure by saturation vapor pressure, and the saturation vapor pressure, it tells us that how much is the capacity of that air parcel to hold the moisture. The more the temperature, the holding capacity is more. That's why actually we fear for the global warming, which can hold the more water vapor, and water vapor is a very good greenhouse gas to absorb the solar, uh, absorb the long radiation or terrestrial radiation for our surface. So this water vapor holding will be more and more, our temperature will be more and more, because more temperature have a more saturated vapor pressure, and it is saturated means we have the relative humidity 100. And it's out from saturation, our relative humidity is less. For example, if the same amount of water vapor, we have 10 degrees centigrade saturated, and we have relative humidity 100, and we warm it up to 20 degrees centigrade, then your relative humidity will fall by half, almost 52%. That means it is only 50%, 48% is remain it to fill up. That means 52% only. It is further 10% if we 10 degrees, if you increase to 30 degrees centigrade, then a relative will come down to only 28%. So therefore, this relative humidity, it depends upon the temperature, and the temperature gives that what is the holding capacity of water vapor. And our atmosphere can hold only 4% of the mass as a water vapor, not more than that. So therefore, it is bound to be saturated when we have more and more evaporation. It is cool, cool down and, and then start saturating. In the atmosphere, all the weather systems or climate systems, see, it is consists of a high and low. It may be totally high pressure, low pressure, or it is, as I told, low pressure region, not close as well. It is a trough, uh, money, re, a trough or a high pressure with a ridge. And in the atmosphere also, if we have low level of low pressure, air will converge because low pressure air will start rushing and it cannot go ground. So it will rise up. Then if it rises up, then if you have a water vapor, as in the upper diagram, and the water vapor will cool down because temperature as you go up decreases by 6.5 degrees centigrade. So if you go a few kilometers, two or three kilometers, then you get the cloud, clouds, two kilometers, so you get clouds. So it condenses, and if you go further, it further condenses to ice, nuclei, and uh, snowflake, and so on. And But this air, as it moves, then it will be from low, then the upper level, you have to divert. That means a high pressure. That is what we call dense compensation, that in the low level convergence, followed by the high level, upper level divergence. So that's why if you have very tall clouds like the cumulonimbus clouds, then you can see that in low level it has a convergence and updraft, and upper level you can get outflow of that. Uh, I will come that cloud a little later. So in the atmosphere, the mechanism is that low level convergence and upper level divergence in between that. We have rising motion because the low pressure uh, air converge, it cannot go down, it will rise. So this vertical wind, which we call not wind, actually we call the vertical wind speed or vertical, vertical velocity. And this vertical velocity is very, very low. And that is because of the, we have actually two major forces working here. One is our pressure gradient force and another is the gravitational force. As you go in the atmosphere, actually I have no time to cover, so I have not covered that. As you go up and up, as you know, pressure decreases. Temperature decreases, also pressure decreases. Because our, as you go upper and upper slab, then our layer of atmosphere above us become decreases. So mass of the air becomes decreases as we go up. Like you go to five kilometer or 5.6 kilometer in the tropics, in 5.8 kilometers tropics, the pressure became half almost you get a 500 HPA, but in surface you have 1013 HPA. So that means just to go to six kilometers, 5.8 or so, 
then your pressure become half. You go to 16 kilometer, you get only 100 HP, from 1000 to 100. It is just a distance of 16 kilometer in the tropics. So therefore, it is a strong upward pressure gradient we have from low to high. But we have a gravitational force. So therefore, there is a good balance between upward force of pressure gradient, downward force of gravity. So they balance each other, each other, and we tell that our last class atmosphere is a hydrostatical balance. But the wind, which you call generally, the wind call it, we call it either horizontal wind, either zonal wind or medial wind. The clouds in the atmosphere really spectacular. You all have seen the clouds. And these clouds, as I told you at the beginning, if you warm and moist air, then it is become lighter, buoyancy. So, and with a vertical velocity and lighter air, then it will be rises up. And as it rises up, it starts condensing. And we have the pollutant particles, it condenses a nuclei in the atmosphere around that, the droplets are formed, and that becomes the clouds. And if droplets become much larger, then it starts falling down, and then the cloud starts melting or disappearing with the rain. So we have different types of clouds in the atmosphere, and that broadly of three categories, low-level clouds, middle-level clouds, and upper-level clouds. And I will not take time for that, but that is one good cloud, that is cumulonimbus cloud, which actually start from the lower to that of the top uh, covering all the, all the three layers. And these are the different clouds in the atmosphere. So that forms, I have told you, but uh, they have different categories there and they cover the uh, sky and we measure them in octaves. That means whole atmosphere, whole sky is covered around you. We call that overcast sky with eight octaves and so on. So this is how the clouds remain in the atmosphere. But you will know you have very specific and detailed class on the clouds. So I will not cover that. Now I will come to our understanding of our atmosphere, ozone climate systems. You see that our at atmosphere is not isolated. It has no boundary, no geological, geophysical, or political boundaries. Atmosphere is continuous, and it is continuous around our Earth. So Earth's atmosphere is having no boundary and it has connection with six spheres they are interconnected that is the lithosphere cryosphere lithosphere is our inner part of the our earth surface cryosphere that is the snow surfaces glaciers ice and glaciers we have the biospheres that all of you know plants and lives plant lives and then we have a hydrosphere, the water body, our atmosphere, and outer space. And there is no boundary between them. They are very much interactive. Though the scale of interaction or time scale of interaction is different, which is different, but all of them, they interact. When planet actually atmosphere created, lithosphere played a very important role by the volcanic eruptions and so on, bringing so many things from inner of the earth to that of the outer side, like water and carbon dioxide and so on. Cryosphere, you know, glaciers, they play a very, very important role. I will show you a little bit how to biosphere, it's important. Uh, as we we'll move further, biosphere plays a very, very important role. And then hydrosphere, as we have discussed already, all our weather and climate is due to hydrosphere. If there is no water, then nothing there. And atmosphere, all of you are very familiar. And at the end, all these things are driven by the outer space, that's the solar system, sun. The energy comes from that. So therefore, our atmosphere consists of these spheres and these arrows, so that their interaction, the interaction is there between them in a different space and time scales. And that's why it makes the atmosphere science, the weather system is a highly nonlinear coupled system. The components of the weather system are open, non-isolated subsystems. They interact on a wide range of 
spatial and temporal scales. Because like, uh, like ocean and atmosphere interaction, glaciers, uh, cryosphere and atmosphere interaction, lithosphere with atmosphere, they all interact, but with a different space and time scales. They are strongly coupled and are characterized by intense interaction at various time and space scales, ranging from micro scale to meso to planetary scales. Besides that, we have the lot of the pollutants, aerosols, so on in the atmosphere. Atmosphere is a good chemistry lab. And you know that we have only, I told you that we have seven basic parameters, which I go continuously and show you that that is a form the seven fundamental laws of interaction equation. But in the, uh, the chemistry, because Atmosphere is a good chemical lab, chemistry lab, because we have aerosols of different types are there. We have water is there. We are getting solar energy. What is more liquid? So a lot of chemical interaction takes place. As you know, if we count them, there are about 2,000 chemical interaction takes place in our atmosphere with different gases and the pollutants and so on, like we have sulfate and sulfuric dioxide and sulfuric acid, all this comes uh, and so on. And this is the exchange processes. Then to know this complex weather and climate systems, we have to actually, though actually I told you that the air, that is the composition of our atmosphere, air actually follow a new fluid dynamics law. So I will go subsequently and I will show you that whether understanding a prediction is a problem of physics. But it is so complex that we cannot get any linear relations. It is a nonlinear complex system, as I told you. So therefore, observations play a very, very dominant role in the atmosphere for its real understanding. Because these laws are become so, so complex. Like you actually you have arts and sun, arts and atmosphere. If there, you can take Stephen Boltzmann law and you calculate sigma t to power four and you can get the radiation. But in reality, we have so many gases. We have so many water vapor there, carbon dioxide there, clouds there and so on. So it is so complex interaction. In fact, all our computation in the computer, if you see maximum goes by, by radiative transfer in the atmosphere. But otherwise the sun and earth, simple, sigma t to power four. So therefore observations play a very important role to understand our science, though our science is purely mathematical based, physics based, and governed by the mathematical equations, laws of physics but it became complex due to various interactions. So they are observation plays a very important role. From observations, we get many, many understandings, many hypotheses which we form, then we get a solution for that, approximation for that, then that gives understanding. Then finally, we the team our atmosphere through modeling, because we want to know atmosphere, how it behaves, why it is a cyclonic wind, is the anticlockwise in northern hemisphere, clockwise in the southern hemisphere, or how the it is blowing and so on, why we have cold weather, warm weather, rainy season and so on. So we need the modeling of that to understand more and then computer simulation so that we can understand or simulate our atmosphere the way we want this modeling. And once we are better modeling, then we go for the prediction. Now you know that we have various ways of prediction, short range, medium range, extended range, climate range, all these things that we do only possible by the modeling systems. But this modeling needs observations and understanding and to make it more realistic and predictable. So therefore, if we see weather and climate sciences, they encompass all the basic sciences. Most important is the physical science, laws of physics, atmospheric motion, thermodynamics of the atmosphere, physical process in the atmosphere, radiation, turbulence, convection, and so on. All that governed by the physical science or physical physics. Then we formulate from that the equations to understand that. That is the mathematical science, numerical analysis, 
partial differential equations because our equations are nonlinear partial differential equations. So it cannot be solved linearly in analytic manner. <clears throat> and then we have to know fluid dynamics because it is a fluid like water and any other substance. Chemical science, atmospheric chemistry, composition of the atmosphere, aerosol, greenhouse gases, and so on. And as I told you, there are 2000 chemical reactions, all these things there with chemical science or chemistry. <clears throat> Biological science are equally important, like a biosphere, evapotranspiration, land use, land covers, and many other things. I'll come a little bit that details as we really follow up further. So biological science also equally important because it is how the atmosphere interacts with the biosphere and how the biosphere also interacts with the atmosphere. They <clears throat> complement to each other interaction because biosphere sustain with the rain and temperature. But biosphere gives us evapotranspiration and many other things, albedo, roughness, and energy balance, and so on. Earth science, like lithosphere, cryosphere, soil characteristics, and soil heat capacity, surface and subsurface hydrology, all this comes from earth science, geology and geophysics. Environmental science, air pollution, water pollution, ecosystems, clean energy, all these things from environmental sciences. And all these things we integrate and we make a model, and this nonlinear model cannot be solved analytically, we need a computer science. Here, computational methods, data mining, parallel processing, architecture and programming and so on. That is so that we can make as fast as possible to predict our atmosphere through a set of mathematical equations, taking different type of data and so on. So that actually ultimately predict. So all these branches of science, as we know, basic sciences, all are in an intimate link to this science. So therefore, Weather and climate science is known as the applied science. It is not a, only one basic science. If we go to physics, as, you know, as I told you already, we have seven basic parameters that I have told you earlier, and they are governed by these conservation equations, conservation of momentum. That gives you the motion of the atmosphere that you win. Conservation of mass, that gives the continuity equation of the pressure. Conservation of energy, thermodynamics equation, that gives us the temperature. Conservation of water vapor, that gives us the humidity. Perfect gas law, that keeps P by rho is equal to RT, P is known, T is known, R is a constant, so we get the density. Because density we don't measure in the atmosphere, we measure out of these seven, we measure the five parameters generally we measure. From wind, we measure only zonal and meridional wind. Generally, vertical wind, we don't measure. It can be measurable, but it's very expensive and very difficult accuracy because it is, as I told, that a strong <coughs> hydrostatic balance in the free atmosphere is there. So therefore, we measure the wind, U and V components. We measure the pressure. We measure the temperature. We measure the humidity. This five. Vertical velocity and density, generally, we derive. Density we never measure, density we get because the atmosphere behaves like a perfect gas. So there is no need of measuring everything and getting the measurement errors and then seeing that it is not following the law. So therefore, perfect gas law, it gets density. So that is how we use the physics, in physical laws. And this laws gives of the two types of dynamical forces and some physical forces in the atmosphere. The fundamental forces, as I told you already, that is pressure gradient force. Other is the gravitational force. Due to gravitational force, nothing escapes from our planet Earth. The air which we have, it is always remaining of Earth. If so, there is no gravity, it must all be escaped like our hydrogen and helium at the beginning of the, our atmosphere. Another most important thing is the frictional forces, that which give the turbulence, the atmosphere, that in fact churn the things and supply the energy from the earth's surface to that of the atmosphere, that is what I call the 23 plus 7, 30 percent in a 30 percent out of 51 percent that goes back effectively by the sensual and the latent heat that comes due to friction and turbulence. Anyhow, I will not go details of that because of shortage of time. And there is so many apparent forces in the atmosphere compared to the Newton's law and our classical physics, 
where we know pressure gradient, gravitational frictional force, we know from the classical physics, but whereas apparent forces comes, that is due to rotation of the earth, that is colorless force, and we have the wind, it is not blow straight line, it will go in the curved path. If a curved path, obviously we have a centripetal and centrifugal force plays in role. Like you are going in a bicycle and speed and a circle comes uh, in the road, then you have to bend yourself to, so that you will not fall down. And that is what your centripetal force. Or you take a stone and take a stick, uh, string, and you want to rotate it. You know that always you pull towards you. If the string is cut, the stone will go away. That is your centrifugal force. And you are getting means centripetal force. So in the atmosphere, we need a never straight line. It is a curved path. So it plays the so centripetal and centrifugal force plays the role. The Coriolis and centripetal centripetal force, they are known as apparent force. Because these forces arise due to that of the hello. Close. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So physical forces also we have, we have momentum plus, sensory plus, moisture plus, and radiation. In fact, that is a complex atmospheric force, physical forces. Similar in the atmosphere, we have the chemistry. So as I told you, there are a lot of chemical things interacted. We have the carbon cycle, oxygen cycle, the sulfur cycle, or nitrogen cycle, all these things are there in the atmosphere. They are the chemistry. And then we have the plant. Plant plays a very important role. And if a single plant is there, you can see that it has a water storage, it has a rainwater transpiration, evapor transpiration, and so on. So therefore, if you see the uh, role of the biosphere, that is radiation, energy balance, surface albedo and surface temperature and emissivity, water balance, evapotranspiration, rainwater interception, stomatal uh, conductance and runoff, and turbulence process, a rough and a leaf area index. So these are the things that is required for the biological science. Also, if you see the atmosphere science in wood and climate, it is the engineering science. All the best equipment that is discovered, all new things appeared in the engineering, it is used for the observational systems, like in weather radar, satellites, aircrafts, you automatic uh, UAV, radar, ships, buoys, and so on, whatnot. All these are electrical and mechanical instruments. Communication is one of the most important things because we have to see the data from various parts because there's no uh, isolation of the atmosphere from one to other part. So therefore, data communication and so on, computer science, engineering, and telecommunications, and similarly, civil engineering for the effective disaster management and mitigations, adaptation strategy. So all engineering branch in many places also, atmosphere science as a considered engineering discipline than science discipline. And these are the gamut of observations that we take in the atmosphere because most of the things we understand from the observations. And whatever we take observation till it is not enough, like the computer, whatever we get is not enough to simulate our atmosphere, similarly the uh, observations. In the atmosphere, there's a lot of variation there from the hours, the uh, few days, the weather and the season and so on that I've told you. Similarly, when we go to the ranges, we have short range, medium range, extended range, long range and climate scale. And Special scales also, we have micro scale, meso scale, and synoptic scale, and large scale. Like we have different phenomena in the atmosphere, short living, short scale to long living, large scale. So the static of small turbulence area of few centimeters to that of the planetary waves around the whole atmosphere. So these are the different processes in the atmosphere. I will not take time because our time is going to reduce. And uh, then actually, similarly, we have, if we have a short range, Initial condition plays a very important role. If you go to climate range, then boundary condition plays a role. And then you will the climate change scales, where actually we should, you know that key, the greenhouse gases, they play a very important role. Extreme weather events in the atmosphere, actually what we call the severe weather, refer, refer to any dangerous meteorological phenomena with the potential to cause damage and serious social interruption or loss of human life, then we call it the natural hazards or disasters, weathers. Unfortunately, that is only 5%. A natural disaster is a major adverse event resulting from natural process of the earth that causes great damage to loss of large number of life. 
then we call the disaster. Fortunately, it's only 5% and it's very localized. Uh, but it has a colossal loss to humanities. So you know that up to 15 million lives lost due to natural hazards in the last millennium. 20th century death to 3.5 million on the average so many deaths per year that you can see. And between 1991 to 1995, damage uh, is caused due to natural hazard is 439 billion US dollars. And in fact, if you see the cumulative economic loss, maximum is due to tropical cyclone, which is almost a uh, GDP of India. Uh, the tropical cyclone about oh, 1,430 billion dollars, followed by fraud, earthquake, severe weather, and so on. So this is a record by WMO for the 10 years period, uh, 1991 to uh, 2000. And then you can see that the hydrometrical hazards are more dominant than geophysical hazards. Hydrometrical hazards like cyclones, floods, drought, tornado, dust storm, heat wave, and so on, whereas geophysical hazards, they all are natural, earthquake, avalanche, landslides, volcanic eruptions, and so on. So you can see 90% of the hazards, they are contributed due to hydrometrical hazards. That is what we are studying. And this is the gamut of weather and the weather and climate related hazards, and it is organized very short-lived and localized tornado to a very long living and large area of droughts. In between, you have all other things, and I don't have time to cover that. But anyhow, uh, I think uh, time is over, perhaps. That is what uh, Dr. Sommesh told me. Uh, so uh, I think global warming, I will not cover. Uh, what do you tell Sommesh? I will stop here to give the chance uh, them to ask questions, uh, or I will go further. Sir, I think uh, uh, we can have another opportunity uh, to hear from you later on. At, we were discussing in the morning. Maybe you can give some more lectures later on. But for today, I think we need to give them opportunity to ask. Many questions have been raised already. Yeah, so, so let us uh, have interaction with them. Uh, yeah. Then actually uh, going further. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK, now the uh, forum is open for the questions. And uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Ayutthi Mohanty, sir, for your talk. And there are many questions, uh, right? Almost 30 questions are there. So I request the uh, question and answer session moderators, Dr. Swagata, Dr. Mohan, and Dr. Rohini to take up this session. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshmiji. Uh, thank you, Honorable uh, Research Person, Professor Yusi Mohanty, sir. So we have found uh, many, lots of questions. Uh, so first question I would like to uh, take care from Shogata Boshak. So he asked, in a scenario, when climate model show clear intermodal spread for a process happening in the atmosphere or ocean, how to distinguish whether it has several stable state or just a single one? Uh, yeah, it, you say it is an interactive state and it is a various scales they interact. It cannot be a single state or single phenomena because the scales if you see in the atmosphere, it starts with a very small micro scale to very large scale. So even a event taking place, like, like uh, so it's a cascading of energy from the smaller scale, like the turbulent scale, they feed to the Micro scale to meso scale and meso scale to that of the synaptic scale, so on. So, therefore, it cannot be a single, it will be a multi scale thing and with a multi scale in the space and time. Thank you, sir. So, another question, another actually two questions from Patita Kollana Shahu. Uh, the question is why hot air contains more moisture than cold air? Yeah. So that's a good question. You see that he, uh, uh, we know that he, uh, uh, saturation vapor, that you, you see that we have uh, in the atmosphere, it is composed of the various gases, like nitrogen, oxygen, and so many other gases. So in those gas composition, if you see that actually, the saturation vapor pressure, that is what we call, that depends upon the temperature. So the temperature tells yes, like how much water that can be contained in the atmosphere. 
So if the more temperature, the holding capacity will be more because there is an intermolecular gap is more. Because you set one place, you cannot keep all two, two particles, you cannot keep at one place. So if there's a gap between them, then it's hard, but another particle can be entered. So therefore, if we have more gaps there, then we can hold more water vapor. But if we actually cool down it, then actually more molecules, they sink, they compress. So therefore, there's not intermolecular gap is less. So that is what we measure in the form of saturation vapor pressure, ES. And this saturation vapor pressure only depend upon the temperature in the degree can be. So therefore, the more the temperature, uh, uh, the, then the more is the saturation vapor pressure. And if saturation vapor pressure is more, then it can go on holding more vapors till it is saturated. Because once it is saturated, then the water will condense. You must have seen that in the bathroom, suppose the vapor is coming and they saturated, and then you see the droplets on the mirror or the roof. Because when either saturation takes place due to either cooling or due to loading up more water vapors. And that all depends upon the saturation vapor pressure. That is a characteristic of the water, how much it can be. And that gives us actually holding capacity. And this ES, saturation vapor pressure, slowly money may only depend upon the temperature in degree Kelvin. Thank you, sir. So uh, the, uh, another question from same person, what is a jet stream and how it affects the weather or due to this, what are the changes occur in weather? Yeah, jet stream actually, as you see that it's just like a water jet, jet stream is a core area where actually we have a really strong wind and uh, uh, both horizontally and vertically, if you see that wind decreases all the size, and then it is a, like a narrow jet. So we have various types of jet streams there. We have like monsoon, we have two jet streams. We have one low level, we call it Somali jet, or a jet stream over the low level over the Bay of Bay, Arabian Sea. Similarly, we have a tropical easterly jet during the monsoon time. It is a over actually southern India and Bay of Bengal. These jet streams like low level jet, Somali jet, it is helps that moisture to converge over the Indian landmass. Because jet stream is just like a water jet you all know, same way the jet stream is a strong wind band uh, in a narrow belt and uh, vertically and horizontally. So it, it gives a lot of moisture pump to the Indian side and that's why you get a lot of rain in different parts of the country, particularly the West Coast. Similarly, upper level, you have tropical easterly jet. So it is actually the divergent flow. It comes in the anticyclone sitting at the level of about 150 to 200 HPA level. That is 12 to 14 kilometer. And that what is doing actually low level convergence and it is supported by the upper level divergence. That is what I told you in the beginning that dynes compensation rule and this as a, being we have two jet streams, they beautifully maintain the, our monsoon for the uh, all the four months, starting from June, that of the September. So these two jets, one is gives a convergence of moisture, other gives a diversion of the dry air at the upper level. Because you go to 300 HP and above, then there is no moisture. It is all actually because dry because temperature is there minus. 50, 60, 70 degrees. So you don't have any moisture or even ice there. So therefore, these jet streams, two jet streams, they make your land these type of things and maintain the entire four months of the month. So, so it has a very different role. Besides that, we have round the year, we have the westerly jet, uh, jet stream, which is a permanent jet stream, and these are the temporary jet stream, and the permanent jet stream is around the globe, and that also not a one place stationary, it won't shifting. And many times we get a winter phenomenon and all things when the westerly jet more penetrate towards Indian landmass in the winter time, then you get a cold wave situations and so on. So they are intimately linked with the weather systems definitely, but it has a lot of role also that westerly jet on aviation, actually. You get clear air turbulence and so on, and that we call the CAT, that also 
गवर्न मेनली बाय द जेस्ट ही मार्सो thank you sir sir one question related to the lapse rate uh, what is the factor affecting the lapse rate factor in the troposphere yeah the lapse rate actually as i told you that is the you know, the source of energy for your the temperature means it is it is the radiative energy and the radiative energy can be if it pass through a body then it not warm it it is only when absorbed and we get source of energy from the sun solar energy but the solar energy comes from a body which is 6000 degree kelvin approximately the outer space so it is a very short wave and this short wave is pass through our atmosphere so therefore it not heated up it is only the ground which absorb that 51% i have shown then became the source of energy for our temperature is not is the sun it is became earth because where actually it is secondary energy because energy come from sun but earth absorb it and starts emitting and like land surface they are very poor absorber and emitter but ocean it absorb and store for long time and this emitted so once it is going then it starts source from the and you know that if it source is always warmer than as you go away and away to decrease but in atmosphere we have another thing the water vapor which condenses so that also release the heat as it move up so therefore we have i gave you two lapse rate if a dry air the lapse rate is about 9.8 degree centigrade per kilometer as you go away away from the earth surface the temperature go on decreasing but in the stratosphere you know we have the ozone is there so it absorbs the ultraviolet ray so that's why it is warm up so therefore it is a actually absorption and transmission of radiative heating in the atmosphere which govern this lapse rate and with a dry air in the troposphere as i told 9.8 degree centigrade with moist air because it is saturated and so on and it is a latent heat so lapse rate it takes us 6.5 degree centigrade per kilometer thank you sir now i would like to request uh, dr shahagata paira uh, to take care of the next part of the q and a session unmute please uh, shahagata ji unmute please i think rohini will take care rohini okay, okay anyone yeah rohini ji un yeah, okay please uh, okay so uh, there is a question a uh, why temperature is constant with height in stratosphere initial Will this scenario observed in case of real atmosphere? Yeah, stratosphere. I told you that the ozone is there. Ozone absorb already have answered this thing. Ozone is there. Ozone uh, absorb the ultraviolet ray, so therefore it is remain warmer. There is another question from Swagato Basa. Why there are only seven basic variables for our atmosphere? is there any possibility of getting more variables as our understanding of the fundamental physics of nature grows yeah you see that if a fluid we have only two variables in the fluid one is the motion another is the mass and our atmosphere is governed also same way with any fluid two things one is the mass another is the motion in the case of atmosphere motion is obviously only three components we cannot have four that u v and w mass is there in the atmosphere which is a constant but it is redistributed the total mass is remain same in the earth surface it is not decreasing uh, and because nothing is escape due to gravity due to gravitational force nothing is so our air which in the atmosphere it the mass is constant it go on changing only we are adding some water vapors and then that water will be coming as rain and so on but total mass of the dry air is same but it is redistributed and that redistribution depends upon two things one is the local change which is mainly the temperature and pressure or subsequent temperature and other is the water vapor as i told you that if have more water vapor then that column will be lighter because you are replacing either nitrogen and oxygen o2 or n2 which is actually your atomic weight is 32 and 28 versus water vapor which is 18 because one place two molecule cannot stay that is your law you know very well 
and therefore one place one molecule so in a uh, area how much molecules are there that gives the mass so therefore uh, for the mass it is the density temperature and water vapor so i don't think and that lead to the pressure because pressure is the what is the pressure force per unit area what is the force mass into acceleration what is the acceleration it is g and what is the mass mass is defined in out much per as i told you constant it is redistributed so so far we have not seen any other basic variable uh, uh, that is needed to know the characteristic of a fluid any fluid and in our case air is one of the fluid thank you sir one more question from charles su hailing how much important the role of boundary condition for the weather and climate model yeah you see that ki actually as i told that our atmosphere have no boundary neither vertically nor horizontally and but actually we cannot go infinitely so if you take a whole globe then you don't need any lateral boundary because it a whole globe is a circle so you can go on in that sphere then it does not need a boundary in the horizontal but then verticality required so horizontal and vertical boundary is required because otherwise you cannot solve your partial differential equations because when you expand your partial differential equations then you need something on the bound surface money limiting that so without a boundary condition you cannot solve it so that's why boundary condition is very very essential and being our thing is continuous to give a boundary condition is very important and it should be very judicious it should be more realistic Lateral boundary concern now it is solved as a totally big global model. Lateral boundary concern is not required, but then you when you go to regional or limited area model, then obviously you have given the lateral boundary concerns. Vertical boundary concern you have to give because vertical actually surface you have different type of surface processes there. You have snow surface, you have the sand, uh, ice, water, and so on. Then you have uh, to put a boundary concern that how much energy is there, how much actually. Uh, 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 fluxes are there and so on. So boundary concern have to be very accurate and judicious for making the uh, model to be more appropriate. Without boundary concern, you cannot solve because there are partial differential equations. Uh, sir, I will take two more because there are many questions. So a question from Sanjeev Divedi. I want to ask that why extreme weather events are increasing. Winters are shrinking or shifting. Monsoon season, etc., all are getting affected. So, how can we uh, we can deal with climate change or variability? Yeah, extreme weather events are increasing. That is actually because of actually your temperature is rising. And climate change means it is nothing but it is warming of the our atmosphere temperature and this temperature warming is taking place as I told you that is due to thickening of our atmosphere with the greenhouse gases. Which it trap more radiation from the earth surface. So once you have more temperature, theoretically, so it can hold the more moisture. So if it hold more moisture, then obviously actually it can come out as a heavy rainfall and so on. And what we are seeing actually, either these extreme events either increasing, but more important, it is seen that both tropical cyclones and thunderstorm and so on. It may be decreasing, but its intensity is increasing, and intensity is more important because if a cyclone is there, it is good. A low pressure and depression and cyclone stage, we get a lot of water as rain. Many drought area, prone area, many scarcity water area, we get water. But when it is severe or extremely severe, then it gives the damage. Similarly, thunderstorm is good, but if a thunderstorm comes during the monsoon time and it comes with lightning and so on, many casualty takes place. So we are seeing that the intensity of these events are increasing, and that similarly total monsoon rain over India is almost remain same as the studies in science reported by Goswami and groups. But then it has, but a light rain is decreasing. And uh, there are uh, days of uh, those, and the heavy rains are increasing. That if more intense rain and that period is increased, then we have floods. And a long period, if a no rain or rainfall, that moderate rain is decreasing, then we have the less rain and we have the drought. 
So it is giving a lot of drought and floods. Though total four months average rainfall over India is around same 88 centimeter plus minus 10 percent or so. So therefore, it is the way it is released, and that depends upon actually because of this temperature rise. Uh, question by anonymous uh, participant: East temperature and relative humidity always inversely related. Because by changing moisture content also, it's possible to achieve saturation. Yeah, because you can achieve saturation by two ways. You can make uh, a air saturated by cooling, or you can saturate by adding more moisture. So either way, you can saturate the air. So there is a, a link between the temperature and the water vapor content, and particularly the relative humidity. It is always, as I show you that, key, the same thing which is saturated with the 10 degrees temperature, it fall to 52% when you are increasing to 20 degree. It come down to one third, 28% when you are making 30 degree. So therefore the relative humidity, which you all are familiar with the relative humidity, it is temperature dependent solely. Uh, sir, should we take more or? Hey, or hey, hey. We can oh, yeah, we can, can, we, can we, take more. We can start. No, no. Uh, I'll go for that vote of things. You can ask questions. Okay, can we go uh, for uh, Rohin, you can take the last question. Huh? Okay, the last question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's a question from Nusrat Ehsan. I want to ask how reliable is the future simulated data of climatic variable? Which resources are most reliable? Are they available online free of cost for researchers? Yeah, actually, uh, you said uh, gradually and gradually our uh, models are improving tremendously. And in fact, actually, when I started 40 or 50 years back, we are not uh, believing so much in the new market with the prediction. But now, now you can see how uh, good we are predicting the tropical cyclones, even four, five, seven days in advance. And de definitely the simulation and prediction things have improved. So also climate predictions. And most of the data in the atmosphere science are freely available at different sources, whether it is the weather data or it's the climate data or climate simulation data. So there is a, so many, and I think our SAMA have a data uh, thing, uh, uh, um, uh, workshop uh, a meeting where they are telling that the different sources, where from you can get data, where from you get a climate sim simulation data like codex and so on. All model data, that the global model data, about 50 models global data also available. Uh, so atmosphere science data is always available. Analysis also always available. Only you have to know where from and how to download. So these things actually SAMA can help. And we have the provision for that. Rohini, we can. Uh... Uh, sorry, yeah, one last one um, from Musa Tanko. Albedo is known to be a degree of reflectivity of the surface of atmospheric constituents. Dense forests reveal low albedo due to its dark surface. Does that mean forest is a problem compounding the global warming? No, no. Forest, uh, you said, uh, this is you are seeing only one aspect because forest actually give also evapotranspiration. And this evapotranspiration give you a lot of moisture. And in fact, actually the water, which come from the rain, more than uh, what we get in the surface, groundwater going the maximum, more than that of the surface water, which goes as runoff. And this groundwater, it come back through the root zone only that is the plants, they again extract by the osmosis process from the root zone, the groundwater, and pump to the atmosphere. So therefore, it, it is not a simple uh, linear uh, relation that can be on this thing. In fact, it is a complex uh, thing. It has many other aspects are there, and they are nonlinear. And in gross way, the forest, they are good, and they give more water vapor and so on. In fact, actually, there are some experiments, numerical experiments, like Sahel deserts, where actually linger for many years. It is shown that if you have a water vapor there, then the desert money, the drought will be disappear. So therefore, drought and fraud, if you see, that is again a uh, role of uh, forest plays a very important role. So we should not go linearly, only one to one relation. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Professor uh, UC Mohanty, sir. And thank you, Dr. Mohan and uh, Dr. Rohini for uh, efficiently handling, handling this question and answer session. So before uh, going to vote of thanks, I think uh, I, I request all the panelists to turn on their video so we can have a photograph. So I request panelists to turn on their video. So I request our friends also to take a photo. Respected Tiagi sir and Shumnath Dutta sir, please. Tiagi sir. Uh, one more. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, now I request uh, Dr. Swagata Paira so to deliver a vote of thanks for today's lecture. Over thank to you. Swagata. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Lakshmi. So it's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks in this occasion on behalf of South Asian Meteorological Association and SRM Institute of Science and Technology. I am very much grateful to Professor Yushi Mohanty for the detailed talk about overview of weather and climate. The talk is so interesting that we have received a huge number of questions. I think first time we have received more than 30 questions. If time is money, then you have given million to us. Thanks a lot, sir. I take this opportunity to express my gratitude to ABM Professor Ajit Tagishan, President Sama, for continuous guidance and support for the growth of our organization and this online lecture series. Thank you, sir. I also extend a very heartly vote of thanks to Professor John Thiruva Degel, Dean Sciences, SRM Institute of Technology, who blessed us with his presence and support. Sir, your presence motivated us for a wonderful organization of this weekly online lecture series. Thank you, sir. I am thankful to Professor Dr. Toida Rashid, Provost, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh, as an advisory panel member. Thanks, ma'am, for accepting our invitation and providing guidance and all support. Thank you so much, ma'am. I express my gratitude to the session moderator and our dear friend, Dr. Lakshmi Kumar, for taking the pain of greatly organizing the online lecture series. Thank you, Dr. Lakshmi. Now, I'm heartily thankful to Professor Swamishra Das. Secretary Shama for providing the continuous support and guidance for this lecture series. In a true word, he is a spinal cord of Shama. His contribution to the Shama is enormous. Thanks a lot, sir. There are around 400 people attended. I also thank all these participants who have attended from different parts of the world. As no program becomes successful with a single person, so I extend my big thanks to our organizing committee members for their tirelessly support all our volunteers. Thank you all for your patience, especially Dr. Mohan Kumar Das, Dr. Rohini Bhavar, Dr. Fatima Akhtar and others. Thank you. So yeah, by this, I just want to conclude this session. Thank you, Dr. Swagata. So with this, I think we have come to uh, the end of the uh, first lecture. Uh, I hope all the participants know that we have 16 lectures in this series. So next week, in the same time, we are going to have the lecture uh, from uh, uh, by next Saturday on 14th uh, January 2023, we have another lecture on weather and climate services at 3 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Uh, it will be 3 to uh, 4 and a half, 4.30, one and a half, it's about one and a half hour. And the speaker of uh, next uh, week uh, lecture is uh, Dr. Mutinjay Mahapatra. He is the current Director General of Meteorology uh, India. So he will be delivering the talk on uh, weather and climate services. So I request all the participants uh, to again join uh, the talk, the second lecture, that will be the second lecture. However, we will send the Zoom links one day before uh, to all of you. It will reach all of you. So that's all. I think if you have any feedback to us, please send us an email. So we will uh, try to improve ourselves. And regarding to the material, so we will try to send uh, the, uh, I think, PDF copy of the presentation. 
and of course the lecture is available in the youtube live stream so you can uh, listen to the lecture if you need again so the video of the lecture as well as the uh, lecture work material what we will send may be useful for the evaluation purpose after the 16 lectures so kindly uh, be with us for the 16 lectures this is going to be the unique program and uh, so after the 16th lecture we'll have an evaluation after that the certificate will be given so thank you once again for all of you for joining here so you made uh, you know as more excited by attending this lecture so we will meet again next week in the same time 3 pm ist uh, next saturday 14th january 2023 for the lecture on weather and climate services by by putunjay mahapatra sir dgm uh, government i mean india so we will be talking on weather and climate services so till then thank you once again so we will send the zoom links again to the lecture thank you very much thank you once again thank you thank you thank you yeah. participants thank you very much we are closing the meeting so thank you very much Sir, we can stop you YouTube live streaming. Yes, yes, yes.